Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, this is joint work with Yevgeny Dolis and Siago. And so let's start by, so suppose um, Alice and Bob um, go for a trip to New York City. And Alice is very excited. And uh, Bob still has, kind of has a hangover from a, a party the night before. But at some point, they walk up to the Museum of Modern Cryptography. Um, and Alice is all excited and says, like, well, let's go see some cryptography. And, and Bob's like, all right, you know, if we have to, let's, let's do it. So they, they pay an admission fee and they enter the Museum of Modern uh, <clears throat> Cryptography. And they come to like this uh, uh, directory and they see all the, all the cool exhibits. And then after staring at it for a while, Alice decides, okay, well, I want to see some uh, practical crypto. And uh, Bob agrees, so they, they end up going to the Crypto and Practice exhibition. And uh, they come by a uh, couple of cool things. So the first exhibit they stop at is like uh, the merkel damgard construction um, with the Davis-Myers compression function, which is basically you take the, the top input here, you use it as a key for a block cipher, and then the lower part here, uh, it, it, it's the input to the block cipher, but then it's also XOR to the output. And this is uh, the design paradigm that underlies uh, the SHA-2 hash function. So they stare at it for a moment, and uh, then they go on to the next uh, item in the exhibit. And they come by like uh, the sponge construction, um, <clears throat> which is, uh, so there is a, the message block is XORed into the top part here, and then a permutation is applied to the entire uh, input, and then uh, the next message block is again XORed. Uh, to the top part, and so on and so on, and they can read here somewhere on a, on a caption that, you know, this is widely used, it's used for collision resistance, it's used uh, to build Macs for PRFs, and so on and so on, pseudo-random number generation. Um, so it's a very impressive. So they stare at it for a moment, they, they go on, they come to, like, key alternating ciphers, which uh, is a way to abstract uh, AES. So in AES, basically, um, so it's first a key XOR to the message, then a permutation is applied, then another key is XOR, then another permutation is applied. And of course, um, a special case of this is uh, the well-known even Mansur cipher, which is simply like uh, one round um, of, of, this, of this thing here. Yeah, so they look at it for a moment, and uh, then they go on and they come to like a public key crypto uh, section, and, and they see like uh, the discrete logarithm problem. So the, you know, it's like uh, there's a, an attacker and the challenger. The challenger chooses a random exponent, applies, computes g to the x, sends that to the attacker. The attacker tries to find the discrete log. Right? So they stare at it for a moment, and then uh, Alice is like, but, you know, how do you assess security of these things? And uh, Bob has no idea, but he has a, he, you know, he just, they get an audio guy. So the audio guide says, well, in, in, cryptography, in symmetric cryptography, what, what often happens if you try to derive security bounds for, for such primitives is that um, you, you replace your, your, your basic primitive by, by something uh, ideal. So in the case, whenever there is a permutation involved, usually um, it's replaced by a public random permutation that is chosen uniformly at random from the set of all permutations. And uh, that can be queried by everyone in the forward and the backward direction. Um, if there is some, some block cipher involved, like here with merkel damgard it's common to consider the ideal cipher model, which is a, a block cipher chosen uniformly and random from, from all block ciphers. And again, for every key can be queried in the forward and the backward direction. Um, so, you know, then they just next to this, uh, they see this idealized model methodology, um, which, which, which claims that, you know, for natural applications, Whatever you prove in the idealized model, you, you hope that in the standard model you get similar security if you use a good uh, instantiation for your, uh, for your uh, idealized primitive. <clears throat> so you don't always like everything you see at a museum. So here is a, here is a toy example. Um, how can you, so suppose for, 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 for a moment that you know, here you can only make forward queries to your random permutation. So this models, this models like the security of one-way permutations in the random permutation model. So basically the challenger chooses a random x, computes pi of x, sends that to y, and the, the job of the attacker is to find, uh, is to find x. 
And so this is super easy to analyze in the random permutation model, right? So basically, um, at some point, the attacker is going to make a bunch of like forward queries here, and the you know bad thing that can happen is if at some point the attacker queries the actual x, and if he doesn't query the actual x, then he has like he can only guess what what x is in the random permutation model, and the probability by simple union bound that he queries the the actual x is uh, t divided by n. So you know conclusion in the random permutation model, uh, sort of uh, inverting a permutation is, is secure up to, to, to n queries to the, uh, to the permutation. Okay, so here is another example. Here is the, the even Mansour cipher. Um, so here the attacker is trying to distinguish real from ideal. So in the real world, um, he can make con uh, queries to the actual even Mansour construction, forward or backward. Um, and he can make queries to the underlying primitive, forward or backward. And of course, the same in the ideal world, except in the ideal world, instead of the construction, we have an independent uniform random permutation. And the job of, of the attacker is trying to tell this apart. And again, it's, in, it's not uh, difficult to analyze this. So basically, there's some bad event that says, roughly says that if the attacker makes a primitive query that uh, uh, corresponds to a, to a construction query that he made, then uh, we give up, and otherwise, if that doesn't happen, he can tell these two things apart. And uh, again, by simple union bound, uh, you can derive this uh, bound here, construct number of construction queries times number of primitive queries divided by n. Um, so what do you conject, or what do we see here? Well, in, in the random permutation model, uh, we conjecture security of even Mansour up to the birthday bound. And well, similarly, so for discrete logarithms, we can, we can use the generic group model to at least rule out uh, generic attacks. Um, so the generic group model simply, the group is represented by a random injection, which is a labeling function that simply assigns a, a random label to every possible um, discrete log. And uh, there is a group operation oracle that allows you to give two, two labels, and then you get back uh, the label that corresponds to the, uh, to the group operation applied to the uh, things that are inside these two labels. So if you look at discrete logarithms in the generic group model, again, uh, there's a well-known result by, by Victor Shoup that says roughly what happens in here is that the attacker computes like degree one polynomials in some indeterminate x, and the bad thing that can happen is like if two, is that two polynomials collide at, at the actual x that you choose. So you, you again get like up security up to the birthday bound even for uh, discrete logarithms in the generic group model. So after a while, um, Bob wakes up from his hangover and, and asks the question, well, what, what happens with like pre-processing attacks? Um, and uh, so it's a good point. Uh, in, in practice, of course, uh, often the security parameter is fixed and a, you know, a dedicated attacker may perform some pre-computation to speed up its online attack. Um, and this we can capture by simply considering an unbounded like first stage attacker that you know does whatever it wants, but then it gives like s bits of advice to the main attacker that then tries to break whatever primitive in question. Um, and this kind of models non-uniformity. So here is a well-known uh, pre-processing attack. It's by Hellman. It allows you to invert permutation. So what do you do? It's like uh, you know suppose that for simplicity the permutation is just a single cycle. So you you uh, you go around the cycle in the pre-processing and you store like points at distance like n divided by s for, for, for some space parameter s. And then these points you leak as advice. And then when you get the actual challenge, here y, you just simply apply the permutation until you hit one of those points. Then you go to the preceding point, you keep applying your permutation until you get back to the original y and the value immediately before is, is the value that you're looking for. So, um, what is, the, what is the space complexity of this attack? Well, it's like it's S because we, we leak roughly S points. The time complexity is T because we have to do at most like N divided by S uh, steps. So if you choose S and T to be square root of N, this is an attack that runs in square root of N and like inverts your, um, inverts your permutation, except that in the random permutation model, we conjecture security up to N queries. So there seems to be some kind of mismatch here. Um, similarly, there are a bunch of other pre-processing or many other pre-processing attacks. So there we can uh, 
uh, break discrete logarithms with a better advantage than conjectured in the uh, random permit, uh, sorry, generic group model. And also the, this, a similar thing holds for the Evermint source cipher. So it seems that our beautiful uh, uh, idealized models methodology is, is on fire. But luckily, um, Alice and Bob, they run into the curator of the museum who had some experience with this in the random oracle model. So uh, the curator um, in, had like the following idea for the random oracle model, which uh, now we generalize to like these other idealized models, is that it, it, this you know, standard format of a security game is simply extended by this, this pre-processing attacker here which, who sees the entire function table and then based on the entire function table can simply compute some S bits of advice and leak this to the main attacker. And now we can hope to update our idealized models methodology to say that if we prove something in this uh, auxiliary input model, then uh, this corresponds to security in the standard model against pre-processing attacks. Again, assuming that you, know, you, you instantiate your ideal primitive with something, uh, something good. So um, for example, the, our toy example, one-way permutations here, now, now you can see that it becomes really hard to analyze it, however, because as soon as you like, see the leakage value, conditioned on this leakage value, whatever it is in general, the distribution of your, uh, of your idealized primitive becomes like, uh, pretty messy, and you don't know what is the distribution of the coordinates, how do the coordinates depend on each other, so it seems really hard to, to analyze this. Um, so, um, let's see what happened in the random oracle model um, with, this, uh, with this setting. So again, so Unru, our curator, he introduced what is known as the pre-sampling technique, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and the pre-sampling technique is, is generally easy to analyze and, and allows to derive bound in this, bounds in this model. And it's generic, which means like, you can apply it to almost any application. Uh, but unfortunately, the bounds that come out are, are usually a little loose, and also it has like limited applicability to, to settings where you have additional computational uh, hardness assumptions. So not so long ago, there was a paper by uh, Evgeny Siao and Jonathan where they used uh, Gennaro Trevisan's compression paradigm to, to analyze like specific um, uh, primitives in, in this auxiliary input model. And uh, the, so the thing is, it's application specific. So for every application, you need to come up with a completely new proof. And it's also generally kind of tricky to, to make these compression proofs work. But uh, the, the upside here is, of course, the, the proofs are, are usually tight. Um, maybe, OK, also here, it's, you, it's not clear how you can apply this to like stuff with computational assumptions. Um, so recently, um, Together with John Steinberger, uh, we came up with an improved pre-sampling pre that you know it retains like easy generic uh, properties of, of the original one, but it also yields tight bounds in the random oracle model, and also it's applicable to uh, computational stuff. Um, all right. So, what is the history in the uh, random permutation model? Well, Stefano like sort of extended um, uh, Unruh's technique to the random permutation model, but it, of course, the, the bounds are, are, are still loose. And then there is known compression results, for example, for, for one-way permutations. Um, uh, but again, it's application-specific and hard. And so in, in this paper, we extend the pre-sampling technique, the improved pre-sampling techniques to the random permutation model and to the ideal cipher model. And uh, we get like easy generic and, and tight proofs. And again, it's a, you can apply to, to applications that rely on additional hardness assumptions. And maybe it's worth pointing out that for like stuff for symmetric primitives, so like Sha one, uh, sorry, Sha two, Sha three, and, and, and even Mansur and so on, there were no like at least to the best of our knowledge, no known uh, non-uniform bounds, so no bounds that account for pre-processing. Right, so here, same thing in the generic group model. Um, at Eurocrypt this year, Corey and Gibson Cogan uh, did. Uh, showed uh, how you can derive tight bounds using compression proofs. And again, also it turns out this pre-sampling thing, you can use it in the generic group model and you get again the, uh, the advantages of the, of the pre-sampling. All right, so I've been talking about it. So what is it? So it basically is two steps. So first you analyze something that in a much simpler model, which, we, which is called the bit fixing model. And then you use a generic connection between the bit fixing model and the auxiliary input model to derive your final bound. Um, so here's the bit fixing model. So uh, instead of like leaking the entire function table to the first stage attacker, 
What you do is you allow the first stage attacker to preset your idealized primitive. So in this case, the, the random permutation at, at a bunch of coordinates, uh, so without collisions, so that it's still a permutation. But then you choose uh, the, remain, the, the rest of the permutation uh, uniformly at random from all the permutations that are, that are uh, consistent with the prefix coordinates. But note that there is no leakage. So the prefixing is the only thing that we're allowed to do here. And the same you can do for ideal ciphers and generic groups. And then there is this magic connection between the two worlds that, uh, that we show. That, so if, if something has like epsilon security in this uh, bit fixing model, then it has epsilon prime security in the uh, auxiliary input model. And what you pay is this additive error of ST divided by the size of the list. Okay. So now, um, and the same connection holds for, for the other idealized models. So as an example, we can go back to uh, even Mansur. So this time I only drew the real world. Uh, so, you know, like this, this first stage attacker, he doesn't, like he simply presets some uh, points of the permutation. So the permutation is twice here, so it doesn't matter where, but so these are the prefix coordinates. And then he leaks some leakage, but the leakage is only gonna depend on the points that are prefixed. It's not gonna depend on the rest of the permutation. So what you can do is basically can repeat your original analysis and extend the bad event um, to incorporate stuff that, that is in this list. Okay. And when you do that, you, you get a new bound. So this is like sort of the original bound here. And then this is uh, the bound that corresponds to the extended bad event, uh, which is simply that one of the construction queries interferes with the, the prefixed coordinates here. So now what you can do is you take the bound in the bit fixing model and uh, you use the generic theorem to, and you get this error st divided by p. And now you can choose P so that you know, this part back here gets, is minimized. So in this case, this would be the appropriate P. And if you insert it, this, this is uh, gonna be your final bound. Okay, so and then similar things you can do for our, here's our toy example, the one-way permutations. So again, you prefix coordinates and you extend the bad event to like include these, these prefix coordinates and you get a new, you get a new bound. And then here, since this is an, a so-called unpredictability application, we have a second version of, of, uh, of the pre-sampling that says you basically only lose a factor of two, provided you choose P to be at least uh, S times T. So in, in our case, um, okay, this should say, this should say uh, RPM, not GGM, but otherwise, so this was our bound here. So if we set P equals to ST, then we basically lose a factor of two. So asymptotically, it's the same, and this will be our final bound and uh, it, it matches uh, the compression-based proof uh, that was known before. All right, um, so the same you can do for discrete logarithms. Um, you update bad event, you get a new bound, you set P equals to ST, you get the final bound, and this also matches the compression-based proof that was known before. Okay, um, okay so let me s sum up uh, <clears throat> the bounds that we have. So the, we analyzed uh, some basic applications uh, like one-way permutations, even Mansur, even like something as trivial as uh, the ideal cipher used as a block cipher has never been analyzed with non-uniform bounds. So this, then we do this. Um, but then we also have like more complicated things. So we analyze uh, SHA-1 and SHA-2. So we have merkle Downgard uh, with Davis Myers and, and the sponges and we analyze them whether uh, with respect to their collision resistance, uh, wh whether they're good PRFs and MACs and so on. Um, and we look at a bunch of uh, primitives in the generic group model, such as discrete logarithms, uh, computational if Hellman and so on and so on. And like um, for, for here, for example, all the bounds that we derive with the simple pre-sampling method uh, match the, the more like involved bounds that, or, or the bounds that you get by more involved proofs using, uh, using a compression, uh, the compression techniques. And then just to illustrate um, like uh, that it also applies to, to, to applications that re, uh, rely on additional hardness assumption. We, we analyze something that's called the full domain permutation encryption um, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and derive bounds there as well. Okay, so here maybe some things that are interesting to uh, find out in the future. So for, I listed two of our favorite applications. One is the even Mansur cipher. So we, we only know how to prove a bound of uh, square root ST squared over N and the best attack uh, gets like st squared divided by n. 
So there is, there is like a, a challenge of getting rid of the square root here. And uh, similarly for decisional Diffie-Hellman, uh, it's also still open. So this is like the best bound uh, that one can derive is square root st squared over n, um, but the best attack only achieves st squared divided by n. Okay, and um, other things like we analyzed even Mansur, but it would be interesting to have like non-uniform bounds for like uh, full key alternating ciphers and uh, see what one can get there. All right, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you.